So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event. Uh, we've had a few technical problems, so apologies <laughs> from our side. Um, this is a one of the the regenerative uh, communities for all, the, or Regen for all, uh, for short. Uh, one of the European Community Practice events. Um, this is a short uh, little project, Erasmus Plus funded project um, to support coming from the work that already been done for many years from Gen uh, Europe, the Global Eco Village Network. Uh, and this is a short one year project ending in December, but with a little uh, extension to the next March. And it's about connecting the eco village world and the academic world and seeing how better to support and work together. And it's created a series of communities of practice at the international, European, uh, Danish, and now the Iberian also, uh, to support local groups on the ground. Um, there's also been a, a new platform that was launched last week. Uh, I'll put the links to later on. And this is another resource to help communities. So practitioners, people in eco villages or in general uh, regenerative uh, sort of practice, also practitioners and, uh, and academics and seeing how better we can learn from, support each other, work better together. Um, the Regen for All project is led by Gen Europe uh, with the support of ISTE in Lisbon, the Centre for International Studies, um, LOS, the Danish Eco Village Network, and Ecolise, which I'm part of, uh, which is the European Network of Community Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability. And um, so it's serving to researchers, practitioners, and adult educators from eco villages and academia. And hopefully, this will lead to further work between these different groups and help more of this ideas get further into the mainstream but also give tools and spaces uh, to assist people make the change to, to ideally toward creating more regenerative communities so that's a very short intro um, i'm going to pass over to mika and i'll share the links now i just want to thank uh, mika and elonka and ad who are here from the netherlands and are going to talk to us uh, about today's theme and um it's a uh, it's collaborating effectively with local governments. Um, we'll put the, the, we've had a series of events already with the Regen for All. They're already on the platform and this will, video will be put online onto the platform as well for others to access and to share with their network. So um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I'll pass over to Mika <laughs> and uh, I hope we have a nice time together. So Mika, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Duncan, for the introduction. Good evening for all of you, welcome. Also, uh, because of uh, Ad and Ilonka, together with uh, them, uh, I will uh, do this uh, this evening about collaboration with your government. Uh, what is really important uh, is uh, to do, to, to, to collaborate. Uh, why do we do it? Uh, I will explain later, but at first I want to ask you, uh, what is your experience in working with authorities? And uh, please uh, make a summarize of one word of it, what your feeling uh, uh, is about it. So what's your name, where you're from, and what's your feeling about working with authorities? Uh, Lasse, can I start with you? And then you can hand over to somebody else when you have done it. Uh, all right, uh, my name is Lasse. Uh, I'm now in Eco Village Buchel, but I normally live in Switzerland. I'm here for a research trip. Uh, yeah, my experience with collaborating with the government. Uh, uh, yeah, what to say? Uh, maybe uh, complicated. And should Thank I hand you. it over? Or yeah. All right, then I hand it over to Taisa. Taisa. Thank you. I'm Thaisa from Gen, from Regen for All, and from Brazil. Um, I have a lot of experience with eco villages, and uh, I was part of a Gen project um, called Eco Village Transition in Action, and it was all about collaborating with local authorities. So I learned a lot about it. I can share the link to the project resources on the webs on the chat very soon. 
but I think we we have more and more to reflect and uh, learn together and especially to practice around this topic. Thank you, and I will hand it over to Amandini. Um, thank you, Thaisa. Um, I'm Amandine from Portugal. Um, yeah, it's a complex question. I don't know which ad I, I, I can put to answer it. But when I was living in a community, in Eco Village, uh, the connection with local government took many years. So it's hard and complex and difficult. Um, the last couple of years, my closest connection, connection was more through transition movement uh, with the project of municipalities in transition, uh, which the aim is really to uh, to do something that was not made uh, within a decade in the transition movement and is more complex and hard. And even today, I gave an interview about that and it was it's complicated. It's possible. It's a hard work. Uh, but this is my closest experience. My new experience is uh, applying the municipal in transition project that is really working with the, the governments uh, within uh, through alternative projects and people. I will pass to uh, um, to Duken. Yes, my name. Thank you, Amandine. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Duncan, I'm Irish, and I've moved around to a few different places. In Ireland, we had uh, we'd occupied grounds to make community gardens. We did illegal bike rides along the canals to try to force law change. We were successful in changing the law eventually. And we even had the Deputy Lord Mayor in a community garden, which was squatted in a pretty dangerous area that had suffered from a lot of heroin abuse in the past. And uh, we managed to get a, a, a local garden given to the community from a, an entity in the community in the end. Um, so got some support at some levels and then at other levels, no support. Uh, when I lived in Brazil, I was part of a network, a, a citizen network that uh, at, the, at the local only level. Uh, and I managed to make a lot of change with Gora. Maybe Thaisa might know Gora in Curitiba. And the ability to engage citizens to become part of the drivers of the co-created visions for change was very powerful in making a quick shift um, after, I suppose, years of political action. So I think it changes from place to place. But if you're organized, I think you can make greater impact. I'll pass over to, um, I don't know, is Callum there? Callum, ah, it's chatted and put into the chat. Maybe I'll read it out because maybe he's problems with the opening the mic. Scottish member of Findhorn long time ago, dealing with authorities is necessary. That's the word I would use. Do you want to pass <laughs> it on to someone, Callum? <laughs> maybe Anna Margarita can. Introduce when you're here, Anna. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you see me? Okay, good. Um, my name is Ana Margarida Esteves. I'm Portuguese and based in Lisbon, Portugal. Amandine and I work together at ISCTE, the Lisbon University Institute. And we're actually working on a project which studies the relationship between co community led, led initiatives for sustainability better for regenerative approaches to transition with public authorities. We believe that um, interacting with public institutions is necessary. Um, one can think of it as a kind of necessary evil, <laughs> but evil, but necessary evil, but which, which is necessary, but which is fundamental for promoting uh, sustainable and successful transition towards more regenerative models and one which is truly inclusive, which doesn't create ghettos or Noah's arcs, but which has the potential to have a wider structural impact. And um, we don't have answers regarding this topic. We, we just humbly listen to community members and witness what is being done and try to, to elaborate concepts and 
and structures of, of thought that can be applied by communities and, the, and their networks to increase their capacity for impacting public institutions. And we are slowly but gradually uh, sharing our research outputs with all of you. And it's a pleasure and an honor to work with all of you. And if and you I would best... summarize that in, in one word? Uh, humbling. <laughs> yes. Humbling. Okay. Thank and I you. pass. Yes, and I pass it on to. Let me see. Ad already spoke. Lassa as well. Amandine, Callum, Mika. Only Art so, Ilonka me. Uh, yes. So who's left? Ilonka and yourself. Yeah. Me. Um. I'm still uh, the one. Um. <laughs> I uh, one word is uh, supportive. I've had uh, good contacts with uh, level a lot of levels of government, and most of the time all it all went well. So um, I'm very happy to talk to you about that uh, during the presentation. <laughs> and then uh, Ilonka. Yeah. Hi everyone, Ilonka. I'm also from the Netherlands. At today, the word that came to mind was fun because I've had such a fun day in collaborating with uh, the national government mostly, but also a couple of civil servants I spoke to today. And that was very positive because all of them were very much in favor of communities. Um, so today the word is fun for me. Mika? Yeah, my word, I have two words, it's positive vibe. Like, yeah, when you really are working on the same aim, it's uh, it's great uh, to collaborate, uh, but there are some issues to be solved, and that's why we organize this webinar tonight. Maybe I can introduce this a little bit uh, why we uh, why we do it uh, in the Gen Conference this summer. Ilonka and me we had this workshop in Germany, and a lot of people said, uh, "Oh, this is really important to, to know also for more people in Europe." working in Gen Europe and uh, starting eco-villages. And uh, that was the reason that we say, okay, then uh, because I'm co-president of the Ecolis uh, uh, Council, that we say, okay, uh, we will ask Ecolis to, uh, to facilitate this webinar. And then Duncan said, oh, that's really connecting to, to the projects we are doing uh, now. So that's the reason that we are here tonight. And the reason is, uh, that uh, Ilonka and me, we, on the day of the Sustainable Communities, the 23rd of September, we had this same workshop in the Netherlands in our knowledge center in Libertera. And at that moment, there were people who said, why should we do this? Is it necessary to work and to collaborate with uh, authorities? And I'm happy that you say uh, that, uh, uh, that it's a necessary column. Uh, and that's what we want to explain, why we think uh, that it's important to collaborate. Uh, Ilonka, can you share the program for tonight? Uh, again, I mixed a little bit. Uh... I think it was the one is, before. Is which sheet do you want to see? Yeah, the, 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 the one before this one. I think there was the schedule of tonight. Can you see this now, the program? No, no. We see the why. <laughs> That's okay. Still right now? No. Oh, okay. I see the program. I oh, can see, see the you. program. Okay. Yeah. Program. Why don't I see the program? I stopped sharing now, but I'm going to reshare and it should be yeah. opening on the program. Here we go. Yeah. Loading. <laughs> yes. And yeah. probably Mieke has a poor connection because now I she, think uh, you look black too. Yeah. I look black. Oh. oh, because I see the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So what we do tonight is uh, we do have the short uh, uh, introduction. Then I will tell something about uh, the project Libertera I'm involved uh, in. We are with three people, Ilonka, Ad and me. We are all settled in the Netherlands. And in my start of my presentation, I will introduce Ad and uh, Ilonka as well. And then uh, we will uh, jump in uh, how you can uh, 
collaborate in an effective way and uh, uh, with some examples. Then uh, Ad, who uh, will tell something about how they did it in Eco Village Bukkel, also settled in the Netherlands. And then more steps, and then we can uh, uh, have some conversations together uh, about experiences uh, and so on. Yeah, and we are in a very small group, so when you have questions in between, please let us know. I think that's uh, that's great. Okay, then Ilonka, then you can yeah, stop let's... share screen, and then I will share screen with my presentation. Yes. Okay, this evening, it's a, a cooperation between a lot of organizations, uh, of course, of Ecolise and the uh, Communities for Future, and uh, Ad from Eco Village Buko. Uh, Ilonka is working at Ener Energie Samen <laughs> in good Dutch, and I'm the founder of, uh, of Libertera. So, um, who we are? Uh, most of you, I think, we know, eh? but maybe a small uh, introduction. I'm a social entrepreneur and I'm the, the founder of Libertera. It's an eco-village uh, concept and we cooperate with authorities uh, about global goals. And uh, we work with uh, a lot of community-led initiatives about uh, climate change and uh, sustainability. And uh, I'm in the, I'm co-president of the Council of Equalities, and Ilonka, she is a researcher, policy advisor, and uh, she currently represents the interest of citizen-led initiative for sustainable heating in the Dutch Federation of Energy Cooperatives, called Energy Sama. And uh, maybe you know also Drift because they are member of Equalities as well as a that's a research institute in the Netherlands for transitions and uh, she studies also a lot about eco villages and you know Art Flems as well I think he's uh, the founder of initiator initiator of eco village Buko, and uh, he makes a lot of positive impact in uh, in uh, their natural surroundings and live without boundaries of what the US can provide. So, ah, okay, good. I don't know if you can see my screen. I think this is better in this way. So I will tell you something about uh, Libertera. Uh, Libertera is a concept uh, for creating eco, uh, eco communities. And we work together with authorities because authorities need to uh, to reach uh, climate goals and sustainable goals. So we help them to, uh, to reach this. And that's uh, the, the basic also for our collaboration. And this collaboration is based on entrepreneurship. And that's really important because it's not based on that we only uh, want a lot of the government, but that we really contribute with our entrepreneurs to reach this. Uh, these goals. And especially we are active in uh, uh, SDG 11 and 13, but we, I always say, yeah, maybe we reach 14 of the 17 goals when we look at our activities. Uh, the reason why Libertaria started was um, that uh, there, in my uh, uh, surrounding, there were a lot of people who want to live in community. And it's in the Netherlands, it's really hard to find land. So then you really have to find uh, how can you uh, connect what, with the topics who are uh, actual in the regions as well. So uh, we, we really reached out to integral area development, especially for farmers who don't have uh, kids who want to take over the farm. So we reuse farms to uh, to create communities together with locals. And uh, it's also a possibility to uh, to transform the monoculture agriculture 
uh, into biodiversity by creating food forests and nature inclusive agriculture. For instance, we have contact with a lot of young farmers who said, oh, we really want to take over the farm, but we don't want to have this intense farms with cows and uh, or pigs, but we really like a food forest. But you can only make this transition from uh, uh, from this intense agriculture to food forest when you have a business model to uh, during this transition. And uh, this transition is important because of climate goals and uh, SDGs. What's also very important and where I also will talk uh, about uh, tonight is that when you really want to reach these goals, you have to change laws. And uh, there are a lot of laws still not contributing to sustainability. And when we really want to make this world a better place, we need other laws to um, to uh, to keep uh, uh, now to, to save nature and to be more in balance with nature. And that's also connected with more shared economies. Uh, I know that uh, Anna Margarita was uh, or is uh, involved in economy for the common goods. And uh, we have uh, all kinds of new economy ideas like blue economy, weak economy, uh, what really is more fair and uh, share uh, the, the resources in this world in a more uh, f uh, uh, honest way. Another reason is that what we learned last year is that we want to, to share it so more people can use this knowledge and experience in their own regions. The idea is to, to spread this so a lot of people can do it themselves or that uh, together we can uh, support each other uh, in this uh, transition topics, what's often not so easy. But can make a lot of fun, like Ilonka said. And uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, so for me also, it's very important that we can learn together, live together and work together in eco-villages, eco-communities, and uh, also with people with uh, special needs who really need more support than, uh, than others. I already told that uh, Libertaria is about uh, making a new start for old farms or farmyards. And uh, what we see in the global goals, I always like this, uh, this little picture, uh, that the biosphere is the most important global goal. When we don't reach that, all other global goals doesn't make sense. So it's really important that we, uh, that we really take care of this biosphere first, and Ecovillages does, so we can uh, really support uh, the, the, the others uh, as well, but it's all starting with uh, care for nature and our environment. And that's a regeneration of the world is uh, based on uh, uh, ecological, economic, social and cultural topics as well, but they are following. I already told that we want to share a lot of information together with others because of our experiences. And of course, they are based now on the experiences in the Netherlands. But we we see in our talks with others that uh, this kind of topics is needed for a lot of other projects uh, uh, as well. And sometimes it's a little bit different, but mostly it's about uh, the transition, about free earth. It's about uh, how can you uh, stimulate uh, cooperation and synergy and uh, on the social topics inclusivity and equality is uh, is really a topic and uh, we want to promote sustainable housing and uh, ecological communities to promote new narratives and uh, new concepts about living working and learning uh, together and this based on the global goals Sometimes, and that was in our 
talk with uh, the group in the Netherlands as well that he said, Mika, how can you contribute the global goals in this way so much? And then I say, when you really want to collaborate with authorities, you need to uh, to reach out to their uh, aims and uh, and um, uh, goals to uh, to really to connect. Uh, what we want to talk about tonight is why do you do this collaboration, and what do you have? Do you need? Uh, to create an eco community. Uh, mostly, uh, people have an idea what is based on uh, social, ecological, or economic aims. Uh, eco villages are. And what is really important is to reach out to authorities to connect with the vision and the mission of the government in that region. Uh, after the elections, they make a make a kind of document and in this document they tell what they will do after what they promised in the elections so uh, they do have a strategy and aims for uh, the area and uh, that is based on our democratic system so when people say oh you reach out to the to the government then I say, yeah, you reach out to the institute of the government, but that is based on what we, how we voted. And that's the reason why it's really important, important uh, to use your democratic possibilities uh, of voting. So the, the, the government knows what's important for you in the, in the, in the region. When I started Libertera, uh, our eco community, they asked me, uh, and they is uh, the elderly man of our municipality, what is your business model? And what are you asking for uh, here in the, in, the, in the local, in the municipality? And when you don't ask for money, it's, it's much easier. And uh, but they have uh, the experience that a lot of citizens only come to ask and not to offer. And when you really want to collaborate with authority, it is really important that you can offer value for the region and be a serious uh, partner. Uh, is uh, you can show by being an entity like a foundation or a uh, cooperation uh, because they really want one contact person uh, for um, uh, to uh, to talk uh, with. Sorry, I have to switch off my phone. And what uh, they really uh, authorities don't have land mostly in the Netherlands. Sometimes they do have, but mostly we have to deal with uh, with landowners. And then it can be very important that you shared the same ideas with this landowner and uh, then go together to the authorities. That's that's really a good way uh, to, uh, to be in touch with them. I want to show you something what was really nice in the Netherlands when I was looking for farmland. Uh, I was in contact with the province. It's a kind of institution in the Netherlands, Netherlands that's uh, called a, a region. And in this region, they had already, based on European uh, uh, laws, uh, an idea how they want to deal with integrated uh, use of uh, land in the area. So this six uh, topics, water, farming, uh, food forest, uh, renewable energy, uh, other kinds of uh, dealing with uh, uh, with uh, uh, insects. That was what they already had in mind. So when I came with my idea of uh, Libertera, we could really easy connect, and that made it more uh, uh, easy to talk because we had the same aims and the same. Uh, uh, we wanted to reach the same results. 
for them who don't know where the Netherlands is, this is the Netherlands and on the left side near the North Sea, that is the part where I do live now and where we create in 2020 uh, Libertaire. And it's in a region what's called Geestmoor Ambacht. And that's a recreation area. And in a recreation area, normally you're not allowed to build. So what we did is really to put value extra in. So for them, it was uh, it was possible to give us the permission to uh, to develop it. On the left part of this sheet, I show you uh, what kind of buildings uh, there were on the farmyard, and uh, after our negotiations, they they decided to take all off, and so we had an empty plot of one hectare to uh, to develop. And what the next uh, uh, this is what uh, the drawing of the planning and the situation in 2020 in uh, in winter with a little bit of snow like today and this the idea is uh, that we really reuse the farmland to build 10 new houses uh, who are really connecting in a in a community and what was important um, in the moment we started, you see on the left upper photo, we had just a, a flat piece of land with a lot of uh, uh, water on it. So biodiversity zero. And now, three years later, we are uh, we uh, we live here together with 22 people, 16 adults and uh, six children. The first Libertera baby was born last summer, and uh, yeah, it was uh, really. Uh, uh, now it's uh, it's a plot where we inspire a lot of people, and um, we. Uh, our intention is to uh, cooperate also uh, on an international base to develop uh, more and more projects for uh, a new economy. Because of the time. I think I can stop sharing and hand over to Ilonka for the next part. All right, maybe we give the floor to any, if there are any immediate questions about the Libertera project, there's also some space now. I'll wait a minute. And if not, I will continue. Thank you, Mika. Um, so what we're gonna present now is a, a small four-step plan that we developed uh, for community-led initiatives. So the, the main purpose of this four-step plan is that uh, if you are an uh, initiative, so you're a person, you have an amazing idea like Mika has, hey, maybe we can start an eco-village or a, a different project with some housing, some forests, some energy. Um, how can you realize that? Um, if you, uh, because you need to collaborate with the government one way or another, as Callum said, it's necessary, uh, not only for some licenses that you need, sometimes also for the ground that you wanna use uh, and also uh, to be good neighbors, let's say. Um, so we developed a four-step plan how to approach this um, with the idea that people that would use this step plan are not very familiar with authorities. So maybe some of the steps are, are very much an open door for you today, um, but uh, we hope it still uh, offers some support. So I'll share my screen. Uh, there we go. So it's four steps. I'm gonna do two steps now and then Ot is going to talk about Eco Village Buko and then we're going to have this, the second two steps. <laughs> so um, the first step is um, that very first thing you want to do when you think about collaborating with the government or starting a conversation with your government is to learn the goals and the language of the government. Um, now, well, basically what that involves is that you look up what are the goals that the government has set for itself 
uh, with regards to sustainability or any other goals that might link to your project and also what's the language with which we mean like which words are they using which terms are they using and how can i use those terms when i go in conversation with them um, so I put a few uh, words here and I'm just going to quickly introduce them because these are uh, places to look up these goals. Um, we start very global and we go slowly to the local level, which is also what I would advise you to do if you are going to look into uh, the goals of the government. So on a global level, we have the sustainable development goals, as Mika already said. Many, pretty much every eco village projects works on almost all of the sustainable development goals. Um, what is often an issue in talking about eco village projects with the authorities is that you are very um, integral, which I don't know if it, that, that's an English word, encompassing project. <laughs> so often you, you uh, and the government has very uh, sectoral goals. So they're always split into different sectors. They're about energy, they're about mobility, they're about agriculture, they're about social things like poverty and work uh, labor. Um, so what you have to do is basically split up your project, your nice integral eco-village project into all of these aspects and link them to how the government is uh, framing them. So with the sustainable development goals, you can look up the ones uh, about energy, water, biodiversity, uh, etc. Um, then when you go down to, oh yeah, and then there's also the Paris Agreement, which is uh, another global goal that we have set with each other, which is to limit uh, the temperature rise to two degrees, which basically come down, comes down to decreasing all CO2 emissions by 55% into 2030. Now, if you live in Europe, uh, it's good to look into the European Green Deal. This is an image of the European Green Deal uh, of all the aspects it covers. And basically what the European Green Deal is, it's a set of uh, subsidies, funds, regulations that uh, aim to reach this target of 55% CO2 reduction um, by 2030. And again, it involves a lot of goals that are aspects of eco-village projects. So you can link your projects to these European goals and refer to them. Um, now, why, I, why we also advise to look at these global and European goals is that sometimes the national government or your local government might not have super sustainable goals, but then the European level or the global level still does have them. So it's good to also look into these goals and link your project to them so that you can, when you present your project ideas, you can link them to these uh, goals. Makes sense. Uh, then you can look at the national level. Here I put the Dutch uh, uh, Climate Accord, the climate agreement. Uh, after the Paris Agreement was made on a global level, basically all the member states or all the, yeah, the, the, the countries have to make a national plan on how to reach these goals. Um, so it's good to look up your government's national plan and see how the government aims to reach these goals. And again, they will always be split into different sectors. So also the Netherlands, in if you can read Dutch, <laughs> they're split into electricity, mobility, industry, agriculture, and houses. Uh, yeah. And after you've looked at national goals, you can go one level lower. Here we have the provincial goals of uh, one of our provinces, which, which basically explains what their goals are for agriculture. And there's a picture of my municipality here in Delft. <laughs> Um, normally I ask the question, we can do this really quickly, I think, with a little, can you raise a hand in Zoom? Or otherwise just raise your actual hand. How many of you know the munis municipal goals of the municipality where you live in? Do you know the goals that your municipality has set? Anna and Margarita does, nice. Ad does it as well. Duncan does not. No. <laughs> kind of, okay, yeah. <laughs> So this is one of the first steps we always recommend is look up in your municipality or the municipality where you plan to do your projects, look up the goals and then pay a special attention to the language that they're using. So for example, Libertara has uh, planted many trees, many plants, but what the municipality has put in their goals is we wanna increase biodiversity. So, okay, the term, the language you use is increasing biodiversity with your project, yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's what we mean with this first step. Learn the goals and language uh, of your municipality um, of your and other governments. Then we go to the second 
step in our four-step plan. That is, who do you approach? <clears throat> Again, quite an open door, but important to look into. And there's three questions to ask yourself in this step. The first step is which layer of government are you going to approach with your project? And the answer can be multiple, but it's look it's good to look into all the options. Ad will tell something about a European uh, funding later. Um, so look up which of these governments have set goals that are in line with the goals of your project or have a legislation that you need. For example, in some cases, the province or even the national government will have you, have to give you a, a license or a permit, I don't know the right English term, for your project. So it's good to look up which governments do you have to deal with and also which governments might be in favor, like I say, with your goals. Um, so that's the first thing you look into. Second thing, then you're gonna check, am I gonna talk with the civil servants or am I gonna talk on the level of the aldermen or politicians, so the council member? or the parliament, depends on the government layer. Um, why we put this here is, that, is because you can have a different strategy with which one you approach. So if the municipality already has a lot of goals that are in line with your project, then you can just approach the civil servants with your projects and go to them and say, hey, my project is contributing to these goals. How are we going to do this together? How are we gonna execute this? If you run into a wall there, which sometimes happens with eco-village projects, that the civil servants might be like, oh, this is a strange project. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, then it's, it's an idea to go to the politicians and tell them, hey, politicians, you've set these goals. But when I try to implement them in your uh, area of legislation, the civil servants are very hesitant. So can you maybe uh, support them or put some pressure here and there? So it can uh, differ which layer uh, which type of governmental employee is best to approach. And then there's the question, the last question to ask yourself is who do you approach? The person. So oftentimes it really comes down to personality of people working in government, whether they are in favor of eco-village projects or in favor of huh, trying something they've not done before, the new something new, because often eco-village projects are quite new to uh, these people. And then there is often two kind of attitudes. Some people are not so much in favor of doing something in a different way. Other people are very much in favor. So what we just recommend is look up on the internet, which people are active in my, let's say local government, which, which civil servants are writing uh, some public documents, which are attending some public events. Look up the names, see on social media, maybe what they're talking about, what they're interested in and find out which person would be a suitable person to pitch your project to that might be uh, in favor of this project. I think that's it for the second step. So we've had two steps. Now we're gonna go back to the, the projects to alt. Thank you, Ilonka. Yeah, I'll uh, also share my screen for uh, the PowerPoint I am uh, made for you. So I am initiator of uh, Ekedor Bukul, Bukul Eco Village. Uh, our goal is to be an inspiring example of sustainable living. And uh, I'm only going to talk about one of the inventions that we uh, test, one of the innovations, uh, our heating system. Um, we have 600 solar panels on the roofs of our houses that are not connected to the electricity grid but they are connected to a big cylinder uh, filled with 400 square meters of uh, steel waste. And there are uh, steel pipes in it, two kilometers of steel pipes. And the power of these 600 solar panels is sent through the uh, steel of the pipes and the steel of the pipes start glowing. And the entire uh, heat, uh, the entire steel clump will heat up to uh, 450 degrees in the summer. And uh, there's two meters of insulation on all sides to keep the heat in for the rest of the year. And when we first uh, need uh, heat in our houses, um, we have air blown through these steel pipes. The air heats up and then goes to a 6,000 liter boiler uh, with uh, uh, water in it. And the water heats up to 70 degrees. 
and three times per day, it pumps uh, warm water for only a half an hour to smaller boilers and then gets back cold water. And that's how we heat our houses. So we don't have an electricity bill. Uh, there's no carbon output with our uh, system. And there haven't been used um, rare earth metals to make the system. Uh, so it's, it's, and you can use it without even a grid. So it's, it's very easy to implement it. You can also fill it with rocks and sand. Uh, it doesn't have to be steel waste, but uh, we did that. But it can be done all over the world, and uh, it's um, it's very cheap. It, it costs within five years you've earned the money back that it would cost to build it. We've won uh, three sustainable building awards and one European SDG award for um, SDG eleven sustainable cities and communities. And we are a living lab for uh, our province, but also for um, a number of companies. We have uh, five or six innovations that are being tested with our EcoVillage. Um, our uh, building materials are almost 100% made from either circular materials, from waste, from uh, other industries, or uh, they are bio-based and only a very small piece have been just made for us. And we've changed the law, and that I'm going to talk more about. We are the only citizen-led initiative in uh, a Dutch uh, law, the Crisis and Recovery Act. And that is a law especially made for sustainable, innovative projects. And uh, once you're in there, you get exemption to regular Dutch laws. And uh, we only had to get exemption to the building code, the Dutch building code, because in uh, the older one in 2012 was uh, forbidding us uh, a few things that we did want to have. And uh, because we are in that law, there are 170 projects in the law. Um, we were allowed to do that, to try it out. Um, and in 2018, the building code was already changed the and all the things that we asked for were implemented in uh, in the, in the new building code one of them was very important for the tiny house movement uh, because in the building code of 2012 all uh, spaces in the house had minimal um, uh, dimensions uh, for instance, uh, in the law, it said that a hallway needs to be at least one meter by two meter or things like that. And, uh, well, in a tiny house, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot abide to that law. So what they did in the Netherlands was build every tiny house uh, on wheels so it didn't have to abide to the building code. But now, after that, we applied for that change of the law. The new building code made sure that all um, all small houses, all tiny houses are now being able to build on land, on the ground itself, which is much easier to, to, to use other building materials that are maybe stronger, but also heavier. Uh, what we also did was, uh, there's a Dutch website called MIAX. It's made for citizen-led initiatives. And in it, you can fill in your social handprint. And you fill in a questionnaire. It takes you, I think, about six hours to fill it in totally in. But it will immediately give you your social value. And your social value is the value of what you save the government because your organization is here. And it's being calculated by uh, the Central Bureau for Statistics, the Dutch Bureau, and that means it's being trusted by the government because that bureau does all the calculations for the Dutch government. So uh, working together with an organization that works together with um, an organization that is trusted by the government will also help you. And I've learned that the MIX uh, is interested in doing this also in other countries or helping others to make it also in other countries. So uh, you can contact them and ask if this, this can also be done in Spain or in France or in Portugal.
like uh, Ilonka and uh, Miki said, it's it's good to use the the SDGs because they're a way to tell a story that connects with the way that the government thinks. I've only picked out one uh, thing here, what we do on SDG 12. And, but you can see there's uh, a lot of places in which we uh, do that. And for each SDG, you can check within your project, within your uh, eco village, what do you do for that? What I always recommend if you go to a municipality is try and get in contact with the informal mayor. That is someone uh, who is uh, easily recognizable because they are most of the time chairman of multiple associations or foundations. And everybody knows them. Uh, they know everybody. They have a very large network. Most of the time they have um, qualities that uh, are bind that are connecting people and also mediating in uh, in in conflicts um so if you get them on your side it will be much easier for the local government to help you because they all all know the informal mayor and most of the time they are very happy with him or her because um they help smooth the way for the government you should always find win-win-win situations and another win. Um, that's not only for your eco-village, but also for the government or any other partner you work with, uh, for the people living around the area that you want to do something in. And of course, for nature, because nature is uh, forgotten most of the time. So it's best to do uh, all of these things because then your... Um, project is as integral as possible, as holistic as possible. And you can get the most uh, um, people backing you. When you're talking with any... Oh no, it froze. Oh, you're back now, Ot. But you're muted. Was I gone? Yeah, you were gone. And the sheets are gone now. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll share again. That's so weird. Yeah. And which was the last one you saw? Uh, the win, 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 and then the next one after that. Okay, well, well then I was only uh, a sh shortly away. Okay, I'll, I'll be uh, connecting now, sharing my screen now again. Yeah, so it's important to find the uh, common ground. Uh, so where uh, the connection between you and they is, uh, that's where us is, where you can uh, connect on a level that is uh, beneficial for both parties. With funding, it's the same thing. If you want to have funding, uh, for instance, we uh, applied for funding at the European Regional Development Fund. And we only asked funding uh, for 1 million for two energy projects that we did, of one of which was uh, the CESAR heating system that I told you about. And um, the funding organization put all 24 projects that applied that year for that grant in order of potential impact. And we were number one. And the, it, this was the first time that a community-led initiative applied for that grant. And um, they were so enthusiastic. They said, well, because you have so many innovations, you can apply for the maximum uh, grant, which is two and a half million. And you have to do the same amount of reporting for one million as for two and a half million. So um, in this case, it was very important that we had so many innovations that we tested out in our eco-village. Uh, um, Ilonka talked about how, how should you approach a large organization like a government. What I always do is try and find the ambassador. Most of the time I ask for a meeting with an innovation expert 
because that is the person who has the most widest vision and is most open for new things. Uh, for instance, when I had a talk with uh, the first meeting with uh, the water company, I applied for uh, a meeting with the innovation expert. And when we shook hands, he said, uh, I have a thousand colleagues and uh, I am the only one who will accept a meeting request from an organization like yours. So you did the right thing coming to me. Um, and uh, they are very open for uh, high ambition projects. Most of the time they can look further than what only their um, organization needs. So uh, wider than the core tasks of their organization uh, because they also talk to a lot of other innovation experts from uh, colleague uh, organizations. And if there is no innovation expert, you should try the public replace the, the PR uh, team because they um, they know there's a lot of positive uh, PR possible with if you work together with a citizen led in initiative, it's easier to have pictures of people and also if you are working with them and you're enthusiastic about them that's good PR. So. There are the two ambassadors you should try and find because even if you need someone else, if they say, okay, I will have a talk first with the person that you need to talk to, then it's much easier to have a, an open conversation because then you have someone who already uh, did the massaging uh, before that you had your talk. What I also uh, do is and um, also recommend is uh, taking the local government, the alderman and the mayor to um, uh, another uh, organization like yours, like what you do, uh, that is already finished. Because then you can show them that there is no fear uh, for the unknown. Uh, it, it can uh, be a good, very good project. Uh, so uh, looking at a best practice will help uh, ease the, the whole talk and the whole organization because then they know, okay, now I understand what this is in reality because they also have to know what it is if it's not the dream, but if the dream is realized. And for people who don't know the picture, where did you take? Uh... Oh yeah, this is uh, Aardehuis and also it's made of earth chips and straw bale houses. Uh, this is uh, something, um, um, a lesson I've learned how not to do. Uh, so I'm going to teach you that. Um, in um, in Bukul, there are four political parties, five political parties. And um, when I uh, give a presentation to all of them at the same time, it, there was a spread, uh, three uh, or two of them, I see now, two of them were uh, enthusiastic and two were not. So uh, I heard from another eco-village uh, nearby who did it differently. What they did is they looked at the website of the first uh, political party with the glasses of that political party. They wrote a letter about their project and they did the same at the next, uh, with the next political party and the next and the next, all looking at, uh, with glasses from their, um, from their political party. So with the mission and vision of that political party and then to their own project. And afterwards, uh, the reaction of each of the political party was that they were enthusiastic about it. So when they did their presentation to all of the uh, political parties, nobody could uh, could be against it so they did it be better than what we did and uh, this evening at uh, 2150 in the netherlands uh, euro news uh, that is uh, the broadcast uh, organization from the european commission will uh, make a broadcast about us that will be 
broadcasted in 155 countries all over the world, including America and uh, Russia. Uh, that will be 15 times broadcasted in this week in uh, different time slots and different uh, uh, different days, and uh, also be uh, ready to be uh, subtitled in seven languages uh, from the project Smart Region. Uh, so uh, when you are uh, very connected to uh, the government, they will are also interested in uh, uh, making a PR for you. I think that is. Oh yeah, the, uh, there's also one thing. The um, uh, our province, uh, North Brabant, uh, has given us a loan of two and a half, two point one point two million for th 30 years uh, under the same uh, interest as uh, the bank did, uh, because they said uh, the way the people in uh, Ecuador Buco live in 2022 is how we would like all of our citizens of our province to live in 2050. So we see the eco village as a living lab and as a showroom. So, I'm going to stop sharing because that was the last slide. Yes, thank you, At. Are there questions for At in the moment? There's a lot of information. Are you still with us? <laughs> <laughs> After the step three and four, there will be a more interactive uh, part. Uh, but it's 18 minutes past eight. We were starting a little bit late. Is there a possibility for you to stay with us a quarter of an hour longer or do we have to stop at 8.30? Great, then we go on and it's recorded. So when you have to leave earlier, don't hesitate and then you can can look the last part um, uh, later. Okay, thanks uh, at again about uh, how you can change laws huh? by uh, community-led initiative. It's always so impressing that um, you don't need to be with an, a big amount of people uh, or uh, with a huge amount of money to change laws. So please, uh, find a possibility to to add value and uh, you can really be in touch with authorities to make laws more sustainable. Ilonka, will you share step three and four? Or three first. Yes, I can do that. Um, I can share my screen, but there's very little on the slides, but yeah, <laughs> but the step is about attitude. Exactly. Ilonka was already talking about uh, how to cooperate uh, or from the European level to the local uh, level and uh, how to approach. And step number three is about the right attitude. I was talking about uh, the group of people who were here in uh, Libertera in September and who were very uh, angry and were also disappointed about their uh, contact with authorities. And, and what I always say is uh, when I have talks uh, with them, I come in smiling and I will leave smiling. And in between, maybe we will have some hard talks, but what is really, really, really important is not to be angry, not to be uh, 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 yeah, have an attitude that is really connecting because what well, you can imagine yourself, of course, that when people around you want something of you and they are angry, then you will not open. So, uh, also when you see that things are hard or not easy or not possible it's always important to find a way uh, to, uh, to, to, to connect and to reconnect. So when, uh, for instance, in Libertera, 
uh, on a certain moment, they decided to take off the farm from the plot. And my idea of my Libertera project was to reuse the farm. So I was really disappointed about not uh, having the possibility to reuse the, the buildings. And at that moment, I could have decided or to leave and say, OK, when you don't um, offer the, the farm, but uh, only the plot, uh, I will uh, look for another plot. But it's not so easy to find uh, places where uh, I could build um, uh, my uh, my project. So then I realized, OK, when we can reuse the farm, I will uh, change our project in reusing a farmyard and reusing a farmyard gave the possibility to build 10 houses, five tiny houses and some double tiny and to build uh, really in a way with bio-based materials, reusing materials. And uh, yeah, that gave us the possibility to reuse the plot in a, in a, in, in a very uh, uh, sustainable way. This right attitude is really important to, to stay in touch. And it's also connected to the next step, the last one, the fourth step. And can, I add, can I add one thing to yeah. this step? Yeah. Um, what I've heard a lot of eco-villagers say, and also the energy communities that I work with, is that you look within your project team, who feels most comfortable in talking with the government? Because it often differs per person, how indeed how maybe angry or disappointed you already are with your government or at which level of energy you are in the moment uh, or how the personality types match of the, the person at the government and the person in the project. So really look within your team who is best suited to do these conversations or maybe go together and afterwards have a little walk. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to add. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this contribution. Yeah. And what I was also talking about uh, when I was uh, presenting Libertera, we, we, what our local authorities said, what was really amazing for them was uh, the possibility to offer something. Mostly they say, oh, a lot of citizens are mostly coming with, because they are not happy or that they come to ask for money. And to offer something like, I'm a citizen of this municipality and uh, I want to contribute, that that's uh, not an a, a attitude that they expect, but the, what really build up the relationship. So what we said is that we wanted to build houses in a space, special place, and we contribute by inspiring the, the environment in uh, education and recreation about sustainability. So what, how can we help them to reach their goals? Uh, because for authorities and especially for politicians, it's important that uh, during their, uh, the time they are in the council, that they really realize the things that they promised in the election so they can be reelected uh, again. So how can you help government to reach their goals? That's uh, uh, and we are citizens in a region, so often we think that we are uh, the opposite, but we have the same aims, but we have different roles, and it's really important to 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 look for these roles, how we can uh, can contribute on it. Okay, that's it about step three and four. Are there questions about three and four? Ilonka, will you introduce the next part? Yes. We have not prepared much for the next part because <laughs> this is open <laughs> for the participants. Now, we want to invite you to, uh, to start a conversation about the, the four steps that we offered on how to collaborate with your government and the examples of the projects that we introduced and reflect a little bit on your own situation or your own projects. Um, how this could help you or what you see as barriers in collaborating with your government or opportunities. And I propose we simply make, because we are with quite a small group, we make a round along everybody 
and with the simple questions like what's your how can you use this information in your local project or initiative that's it i think all right um is there anyone who would like to start or shall i give the word to someone i do not see a hand so i will start with the first person i see that is lasse uh yeah what to say uh so I am uh, yeah, staying at uh, Ekedor Pukel at Ad. Uh, so during the last month, I was uh, privileged to witness yeah, some of the things that uh, he just talked about. Uh, so I'm not so, yeah, I'm not uh, living a, in, or active like in a in an own personal community. Uh, let me see. Uh, one of the things that maybe yeah, spoke to me was... Uh, Mm, yeah, from the four steps to make like very explicit, uh, yeah, uh, to uh, what a uh, project, uh, what your project can offer to the government, make that explicit, link it to uh, yeah these goals from the government, which they also need to realize. Uh, yeah, mm, I think, uh, yeah, I think here in Bukel they are, yeah, they were quite successful to do in doing that, especially doing that at different levels. So from the local government, also to the municipality. Uh, yeah, the, the mun uh, municipal government. Uh, I uh, yeah, will also uh, still have an interview scheduled with a person from the uh, yeah, from the local municipal government in Eco Village Bukel, which will be very interesting to also learn a bit more about like how they perceive this uh, yeah, these steps and uh, these processes that uh, Art just presented. Uh, I think maybe this uh, yeah might bring up uh, some uh, yeah some points that uh, yeah we maybe don't uh, talk about so much when more uh, yeah approaching the topic from more the eco villagers or the yeah the activist perspective. Uh, yeah, which uh, yeah which might be uh, yeah. Uh, at, which uh, yeah might be able to add something, and also in uh, uh, yeah interviews I had with people from the eco village that yeah are active in this collaboration with the local government. Uh, I think multiple times it was highlighted this also yeah translation and uh, adjusting your language, uh, yeah which was also mentioned before. Uh, there was also something I recognized here while doing the research here. Uh, yeah, these are some things uh, that came to my mind. Thanks. Who do you pass it on to? Uh, I pass it on to Amandine. Thank you for passing. Um, well, um, as I said before, for me it's difficult because um, I, I don't know which hat I, I should use. Um, I'm not doing research especially on the topic, although I'm interested in. Uh, I have some practice, uh, but in terms of... Um, when I was living in Echo Village, it was, I don't know if it was because it was in Portugal or basically the vision and the way we, we, we did it or we constructed the Echo Village on that time, uh, but we, we didn't have so much local government uh, interaction by those early years, uh, only on the end, uh, in the end in relation of the time where I was there. Uh, and at this moment, I'm doing research, but it's not on a topic, although uh, I practice uh, and I try to facilitate uh, a methodology to to get to, how do you say, in transition. So the municipal is in transition uh, project that is specifically um, focused on uh, create uh, this interaction between local citizens and other um uh, organizations with the with the municipality, but I, I did not uh, um, I did not have uh, had um, uh, the proper uh, application in in the in the place I'm living in Cascais, but I did it in the, in the north of Portugal uh, within another context. It was effective. But quite complex because of the methodology. It was uh, introducing some kinds of governance and sociocracy. But um, as I'm saying, it's not about eco village. It's more about uh, community in a urban setting. Uh, although the, the the method can be applied any, anywhere, uh, 
and uh, there are some bridging uh, similarities in some uh, other methods and circles that I, I've, be, I've been uh, seeing in Echo Village and Gen, for example. But I, I, at this moment, I, I, I'm not researching on a topic. I have some experience, but it's difficult for me to. <laughs> it's complex for my my brain to to which from which reference I, I should speak. That's uh, yeah. A congratulation for the the um, all the speakers and your your um, contribution. They were great, really great, great case studies and experience on the topic. So I'll pass to Hanna Margarida. Okay, I I second what what Amandine just said with uh, with a further detail that I never had the experience of being, you know, of interacting with public authorities on behalf of communities. So the kind of role that I've been playing is is that of the activist researcher who's was harvesting knowledge on this topic and sharing it with uh, communities and, and networks of community-led initiatives. So what I'm doing is just listening and learning and hoping that the, um, that the outcomes of our projects will contribute to strengthen these networks, including Jen. So, but, it, but it's really interesting to, to listen to to um, to uh, to Mika talk about Liberterra and also about and also about the the experience of a uh, Boca Leco village. It's it's very interesting and inspiring. I just wonder if this if the, the lessons that can be harvest harvested from these two examples can be transposed to other contexts, or if they are like country specific and and, and and specific for a given institutional culture? It's a big question mark. Yeah, and this is question. something that we need to look into. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Who do you pass it on to? Pass it on to Ad Vlems from Ecuador Vocal. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's the the four steps were uh, very well fit in with the examples what I gave. So uh, I, I liked uh, having them uh, as a as a, a holder for the story that I have. So um, and also I know the story of Mika, but it's it's good to uh, hear it again as. Uh, uh, only visit with the eyes of uh, how to connect with uh, local government. And you heard the rest of my story, so uh, <laughs> I pass it on to uh, Amma. If Amma is there. Amma. Callum, are you there? Andre. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I couldn't see the whole presentation. I'm sorry for that. Um, but I got some things and I met Ed uh, in another time. Uh, and it's always great to hear from him. I have three observations that that uh, sparkled a little bit my curiosity. Uh, maybe I can mention them. So I like the, the part where Ad talks about building on other villages or other initiatives, experiences, for example, uh, when he talks about uh, what they did uh, in terms of talking with different uh, authorities at the same time and, and separately and so on. I think that was a it was something that was uh, interesting to me. Also, when he talks about win, 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 win situation. So look, and here I have a little bit of a provocation, uh, both to Ilonka and to Ad. Uh, from what I understand, uh, I understand very little bit about Boko, but from what I talked to Ad before, um, Ad is is more or less the face of Boko. So he's always speaking on the name of it in in. Uh, with the government in uh, other 
uh, events uh, online and so on, uh, both because he's good at it, I heard, and also because he's interested and he sees the bigger picture. But um, And then Ilonka mentioned about something that uh, it's more like a curiosity to me. So Ad is constantly there doing this work uh, very well and got some a lot of things done because of that. He's a recurrent face. He's known uh, within uh, national and local government, perhaps even. Um, but then you said, Ilonka, something about who at the moment wants to talk or feels comfortable about talking on this topic with the local government and so on. And, and then my provocation is, isn't that if, if there's a lot of shifting on this face or, or a little bit of shifting, doesn't it cause some kind of confusion and or, or uh, it has could have uh, some other effects? I don't know how yeah. you see that, or, or but that uh, is a little curiosity on mm -hmm. my side. How do you see yeah. this? Two sides. On one side, you have Ad as the face of, of that uh, or representative. And on the other, maybe multiple representatives can cause something else. Yeah, I think this is a very good observation. One that maybe we could have included is like to demonstrate stability or to show stability towards the government. Hey, I'm a trustworthy companion uh, to collaborate with. So then it really does help to have one spokesperson or two, one or two that are constantly there. Uh, I think the point I was trying to make is that sometimes the the initiator of an eco-village project or an energy community or whatever is very much a pioneer. And sometimes these people are not so much in favor of governments. So it might be that not the initiator of a project, but a project, a team member who is more uh, used to collaborating with governments or who likes it better is a better spokesperson. So the, I think the point I was mostly trying to make, it doesn't have to be the initiator uh, it doesn't always have to be the same person, but some stability is is nice. But yeah, to mm -hmm. to strategically think about this, Mika, you want to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about building up trust. And uh, what the the elder men in my municipality said that they were a little bit hesitating because there were some projects here in the region that were not so positive collaborating with authorities. So when I start talking with them, they said, "Ah, oh, there is so another uh, green entrepreneur." with these, uh, we call it uh, uh, woolen socks in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, yeah, they are just uh, activists and they are not willing to listen and to understand that we have to reach our goals as well and that we have to deal with a lot of different topics and a lot of different uh, 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 ideas of people. So uh, there was also once a moment that he said, okay, is this this is not the the solution for the housing uh, crisis we do have in the Netherlands? I say no, it's not the solution, but it's a solution, and it's to inspire. And what I see in my own community when I say I go to the municipality, see the mayor or the elderly man or some other people, politicians, who wants to go with me? It's it's silent. <laughs> so it's. Uh, it's often that most people in eco villages are more willing to create new food forests and uh, permaculture gardens than go and negotiate. Uh, and especially on the ministry, with the ministers and uh, people uh, who are really authorities, a lot of people are a little bit afraid of authorities. So you, I think what Ad and me have in common is that we are not so impressed by them. And that's the reason why we can talk. <laughs> so I think this attitude is that you can meet face to face with people who are in a place because they have some uh, some ideas of the future as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to say something about it. Uh, um, um, what I always do with when I go to someone uh, from a government, I always think they are also a, a son or a daughter. They also might have children and they also might see what I see in the world. So I, I go in very open and uh, at one point in the meeting, I see glistening in their eyes and I see them sitting up straight and I know, okay, this is what the person is most interested about. And then we have the connection and we can start looking for the common ground. 
why what you see why my face is most of the time uh, the representative of buccal ecovillages because uh, 40 hours per week I do voluntary work as uh, the representative that's why I invest so much time and uh, I'm the one going to all these things because I ha have time because I make time but not everybody can do that there is one thing, sometimes you can hitch a ride together with an eco-village that does have someone who has more time and has a, a face that's up, uh, that's more well-known in a province, for instance. So you, sh you should really uh, make, uh, uh, use that, that the, per the person who is has already made an eco-village, most of the time is very happy to help another one to also make an eco-village because then they are, you can be a pioneer and if nobody follows you, you're just a weird guy doing weird things. And uh, if you have people follow you, that's also a recognition that what you did was a good thing. So that's why you can contact also others who are more well known with the government and uh, help you, help you uh, to make your uh, standpoint better word. Mm -hmm. Could I continue? I have like two more yeah. things to say. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if we have time, but I have, um, I'll try to be very brief. First, uh, a little shorter about the Crisis and Recovery Act. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting tool and uh, very impressive in a lot of ways. So if you have thought of how to bring this to other countries, other nations, other uh, municipalities outside the, the the Netherlands. That's one question. And how would you do it, <laughs> or something like that? And then another question is uh, to to maybe Mika and Ad about like you have roles of networkers and of representatives, as you as you just said. And I'm very curious to see. I'm I'm, I'm younger, and uh, usually I see people of uh, higher age re representing the eco villages or the community led initiatives and so on. And then, how do you see? How do you pass the stick to the next generation? Imagine that uh, uh, within I, I don't want to say a time, but a, a few months, you're not in that role anymore. What would you pass to to a new? Uh, representative and so on, someone that is going to have this constant connection with local government authorities and so on. Like, what do you think are 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 the key things that you would like to see for the next ones? And so on? I know a lot of your, uh, I know a lot of your talk was about this, but more at the personal level, not so much as the structure level of of the the connections. Uh, imagine that you're talking to this next generation, for example, right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, I start and then you add, uh, yep. uh, uh, I already told that we created the Libertera platform. And one of the biggest reasons for me to do that is to hand over to the next generation. Because uh, I hope I can do this work a lot of years, <laughs> not an, a, a few months or a few weeks, but uh, a lot of years. And what is really important is to learn the next generation of our experience and to realize that we are learning every day. Uh, so don't copy what we did yesterday, but learn together uh, about the experiences of today and add uh, the topics what for use is important. And that is also that uh, in uh, in Erasmus Plus, that's a European uh, subsidizing possibility. There is a possibility for democratic participation of youth. And we had this uh, subsidizing this year uh, and we connect with the elections of the, uh, we had the uh, parliament elections in November. So we talked with also young people about, okay, how can you influence the policy and what can you contribute and how do you want to grow in these uh, talks with politicians? So uh, we learn them to, uh, to be clear in their topics and to talk with elderly men and uh, people who are in the council. So they are more familiar to do that. So, and when I go to the municipality, I mostly take one of my young people with me. So they get this experience as well. Because uh, I was in Portugal in a 
permaculture training a few years ago and then it became COVID and I had to stay another 10 days. And then I re realized I'm in the elderly phase now and I have to hand over. That's really important. Art? Yeah, it's uh, it's easy to do when when uh, they are um, together with you. So if you, you are going to a municipality or to a ministry, take them with you so they can learn and they can see that it's not scary and uh, just normal people on the other side of the table. Uh, last seven weeks, I, I pulled uh, Lasse to get with me uh, for a number of meetings. And... Um, uh, I hope I can do the same with other people in uh, in Eco Village uh, Bukel. Um, uh, there are some things that I've already uh, transferred to other people. For instance, the the meetings with the municipality of Bukel, the, uh, uh, they were are now done by three other people who volunteered to do that. So last meeting I wasn't even there. Um, so it's a, a don't have a big ego and step aside to help others to step in. That's the, the what I would give the older people as an advice. <laughs> because you know, as a young person, you have to step in, and somebody has to go on the sideline. Otherwise, you can't step in. And I think Ilonka, there are a lot of young researchers eh, who are involved now. I was going to say, I started out when I was uh, 21 uh, researching eco villages. Uh, and I think the fact that they offered their spare time to talk with me, have me interview them, and even offered me actually, actually uh, Fred Jan from Ecuador Berge to join him on a meeting with the municipality, that helped me to roll into this world. So it works. I'm still here. <laughs> And I'm curious about this meeting, uh, Ilonka. <laughs> That's <laughs> another topic. <laughs> okay. Who... André, do you have more points? or? Uh, no, I, I have I a know. list, but but maybe <laughs> we go to the next person. Uh, I thank you so much for, for speaking. Maybe uh, Duncan, if you want to say something. Uh, well, no, I'm happy to share to you. <laughs> if you want to add more points, you're on a roll. Uh, then I can go back to the Crisis and Recovery Act part because it was a, a first question, maybe it got lost. Like, how would you export it or or apply in other contexts? Or have you thought about it? Have you had conversations about it? Well, uh, two weeks ago, I could give a presentation to three Belgium provinces and uh, three Dutch provinces. So I talked a lot about the Crisis and Recovery Act, and um, I was hoping that one of them would, would ask me that question on how to transport, transform it. If I was uh, one of the um, governors, uh, like they call them in, in Belgium, then I would uh, uh, ask for uh, the law and then change Belgium to the Netherlands, give it to uh, legal aid and say, can you please make sure that it abides to the Belgium laws and then uh, give it to the government and say, I want this. I need this for my province. Because it, uh, when I gave uh, in 2018, 18, I gave a presentation to the EU and I could give the closing presentation on a, an EU symposium on um, uh, circular economy in practice and uh, before me there were seven presentations that were all about legislation that made it impossible for new circular economy uh, products to be implemented and when I talked about the crisis and recovery act uh, someone from Estland, Estonia said now I understand why the Netherlands is uh, the pioneer on uh, circular economy because you have a law that gives you exemptions to regular laws, and that's what we need. So if, and, and that's only on circular recovery. In the Netherlands, you can use it in any area, this Crisis and Recovery Act. And now there's coming a new law, uh, in, 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 in an environment law, the Omgevingswet it's called, yeah. Thank you, Mieke. And uh, that also has, uh, all of the 170 projects that had positive impact is implemented in that law. 
And also there's an experimental uh, phase uh, possible. So it, it, even if you want to try out something new, that's also possible. Uh, so you can also copy that law because it's quite new. Yeah, and that's interesting. This law is about protecting and uh, using the environment. And this protecting topic is really new. And it's uh, this uh, this new law where I was talking about, uh, I contributed in a book last uh, month of it, is uh, they uh, we had 26 laws about nature, environment, water, building, that kind of things. But sometimes uh, the, uh, the laws are not in line with each other. So then when you want to, uh, to uh, to use all these laws in the right way, it's always conflicting. And what they are doing now, they put these 26 laws together. And this, the history of this law is that in Europe, they asked the Dutch government to do this because of this attitude in the Netherlands I, I was talking about, uh, because we are willing to pioneer. Uh, because we are always, we call it a polder model because of the, the, the water in our, in our land that we always want to to do it in a different way than what is written down. That's us. Huh? We don't accept laws. That is, I think, typical Dutch. And what is also the possibility, and we used it in our uh, uh, building site, is uh, it is situation, situated in a recreation area. And in a recreation area, it's not allowed to build. But when you make it a uh, a plot for recreation and education of sustainability and you add housing to it, then it's possible for 10 yeah. years, temporary. And when something is there for 10 years, our uh, mayor says, okay, when you don't make trouble, after 10 years, nobody knows that it is temporary. And when we change the, uh, we call it bestemmingsplan, there's the use of the land every 10 years, they change the use of the land or the possibility to change the, 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 the use of the land. And then during this period, after maybe seven years or 12 years or, or nine years, then uh, it's from temporary to common. And that's the way you change the world. And what they say about laws is always, uh, a law is always behind. It's not, or, or it is really uh, made to change something, but mostly it's behind. So what we have to do together is to make new best practices to change the law. And that's what us and me are doing. Yeah. I can add, I think, one more thing to this, that in a lot of cases, the municipality don't really know how to see you as a partner because you're not a company, you're not a private party, and you're also not a government. And then they're like, okay, how, what are you? And now it really helps that the European Union has has given a legal definition of the energy community. So there are two definitions now in at the European level that define an energy community as a different type of uh, juridisch entity, uh, legal body, I would say. So you're not a private party, you're not a government, you're a community. And what defines a community? There is a certain uh, criteria for that. Now it's only done for energy communities. But what we see now in the Netherlands, which is my work, is that we can transpose this to other types of communities. And then we can say, hey, this is a new movement. The commons movement is really rising, uh, which demonstrates that communities are a different player and different rules and laws should uh, be in place for them, especially regarding uh, uh, state support, uh, procurement rules, these kinds of things, you're, because you're a different type of legal entity. And here we really see that it helps that on a European level, they were quite groundbreaking actually in making this definition of energy communities. And it has set the door open for definitions of a general type of community, yeah? uh, citizens united for a certain cause, basically. I think in the future, this will enable, make it easier uh, when you go and talk with the government to explain what are you, how can they see you, uh, how can they collaborate with you. But this is still in an early stage, but I think it's promising for this movement. Yeah. Yeah, we have another five minutes left. So maybe, That's Anna, do community. you want to add something or? Are you asking me? Yeah. No, no, Anna. Anna. Oh, Anna. 
Anne. <laughs> I was listening and actually it's really close to my topic and it's really interesting. I just wrote, uh, I just read an, a bachelor work, a bachelor thesis about um, energy communities. And um, yeah, I think it's a good chance what is happening right now on the political scale. And I also like, I was really happy uh, listening to what you've just said, uh, Ilonka, um, that the commons movement is rising in the Netherlands, that it's getting more and more attention because um, I was accompanying the commons movement here in Germany a lot. And what I appreciate is that it gives names and it gives words to the things communities are doing and it's getting more and more accepted and it's, it's getting more and more into other discourses on a political scale and also in a, it's, it has academic words to bring it there. Um, and that's, I think it's it's a great chance and yeah. Let's put that forward <laughs> for the great presentations. Yes, thank you. And in this uh, in this new law we were talking about, uh, not only private and public are talking together, but that the commons really have a voice when you want to uh, to develop in the environment. So it's really participation is really. Uh, uh, based now in the procedures. When our neighbors don't agree, you can forget it. So what's really important in, in also in my project was to talk with the neighbors first, ask them what was important for them. Uh, in the moment that Ad was developing, he was the first one and then the neighborhood was coming around. So they had to accept. But in my case, I had neighbors and they said, okay, the parking place is not happy with them and uh, uh, please can we have some more trees in between and together with them we ask for the permission instead of uh, that they can uh, reply after so that also saved us six weeks of time because they don't had uh, because the most important people already uh, told uh, if they could agree and you really build up relationship in the neighborhood in advance and then you can collaborate uh, and uh, and contribute to the environment together. My dear friends, it's 2058. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know if there is a very, very special question. Otherwise, maybe we can have the check out in one word. Andre has a very special question. Andre, of yes. course, Andre. Another well, other time we can have another two-hour session with you, Andre. No problem. <laughs> I would love that. I don't have a question. I actually have many, but uh, it's not a question. It's uh, our platform is launched, so I think it's uh, very nice to say to Mika and Anilonka that we do have uh, a library there. A database with a lot of documents and so on, inclu including the Crisis and Recovery Act is there. Uh, I put it myself and I think it's very important. It's there with tags of Dutch uh, language of uh, legislation and so on. And it would be very nice if you could, we have a, a, a link there to, to collaborate. So if you have documents or this new legislation uh, and so on, uh, I think Duncan just pasted there. Uh, there is a link to collaborate, to contribute. So if you have uh, first-hand documents, books, uh, links, etc., when you use that link for contribution, it comes straight to us and we can provide to the public. So just a suggestion, and, and if you want to share documents, it can be in Dutch, uh, it's multiple languages. So this is uh, a call to contribute on that. So uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the presentations. Thank you very much. Our last question for the checkout is, uh, did, uh, are there some changes in your ideas about uh, cooperating with authorities now? And please, one word again, so we will not be so much over time uh, after nine. Uh, Anna Margarita, do you want to start? Okay, so uh, as a checkout, I'm like I said, I'm I'm really happy to hear about your experience. I look forward to knowing more. Possibly, we will contact you very soon to know more about about what you've been up to for our research. And well, well, that's what I have to say. And I second what Andrea just said. 
uh, we are we have been working on a library that aims to um, you know that that aims to to bring academic research on eco villages closer to eco villages and eco villages closer to to the research pro uh, process in order to to deepen collaborative relations and in and also in order to make this process much wider and much more inclusive and I also second uh, a comment that was he that was written here in the in the chat box by Colin, it's Colin McCallum, about how your about how how your experience is is a relevant example of of uh, dynamics in the global north, especially in the most industrialized and uh, countries and the most advanced democracies. Now the question is, to what extent can can these lessons be generalized to? Uh, to other countries, even within Europe, or if we shouldn't think in a comparative way and try to, um, and instead of trying to, you know, trying to to just to just spread the, those practices to um, uh, to other countries, if we shouldn't just if we shouldn't promote a dialogue, a, med a mediated dialogue that that takes into account. Uh, differences in terms of institutional structures, in terms of political history, in terms of specificities in the way in which um, different civil societies relate with public institutions. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can have another webinar about it. Uh, we will talk about Absolutely. wisdom. Actually, okay. Actually, and in one, in one word, sorry, I, I, I just wanted that. to... Uh, I just wanted to make a, a, a remark. Amandine and I have been thinking about a webinar on this topic in the framework of the Iberian Co-op. Great. So um, in one word, contextualize. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And you hand over to... <laughs> and I hand over to Duncan. Keep it short. Uh, keep it positive. Bring them more on board and uh, go with the visions, the positive... Brilliant vision. So to you guys, thank you well. <laughs> and you hand over. I'll pass it over to Lass. We don't hear you. I don't hear you, but... I think now you should be able to yeah, hear me. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, uh, it was <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, great to hear. Inspirational already, hopefully... By now, I know a bit more about the Ecofilis Google already, but it's still interesting to hear it also in the form of such a presentation and with other reflections on it. Uh, and uh, yeah, one word, uh, uh, maybe in inspirational. And I hand it over to Ilonka. Thank you. How did it change for me? Mm, yeah, I think I'm inspired with the presentations of Mika and Ad. Yeah, inspired. I hand it over to Anna. Yeah, I can only second this and I'm grateful having you here. And I was thinking a lot about our ETA project, Eco Village Transition and Action project that we were working on before. And I think we can like I think it's a good idea to to have this presentation put into that and make some seminars out of it. I think it's a great idea to, to do that, maybe for our entire network, what Anna Margarita said. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and you had uh, have been here, so that was really nice to go uh, to see it in practice a few <laughs> years ago already. But uh, yeah, okay. I think you, Mika, already. Um, I pass over to Ed. Eco Top Thank you. Uh, I also found it inspiring to be with you and I want to thank everyone for all the questions, especially Andre, of course. <laughs> and uh, I hope to see you another time. And I pass it on to Amandine. Oh, no, uh, she already was. Uh, Ilonka. She also was. She also. Okay, then only Mika? Yeah, I think, I don't know if Colum is still with us. Grateful, like a start of webinar, I'm not that surprised to be inspired by the contribution. Keeping up, the good work will continue. I'm as sure of that as at start. Thank you, Callum. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for me, it's always so uh, interesting to talk about and to hear the different uh, 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 stories and experiences. So, yeah. 
uh, thank you very much. That's uh, yeah, grateful to 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 share. And thank you, Ecolis, for this platform. I think it's really amazing that uh, that we have this possibility uh, to uh, to share. And uh, I hope a lot of people will listen later as well. And uh, I'm looking forward for the next webinar with Anna Margarita and Amandine. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully, hopefully we can continue this and keep connecting these networks together, learning how to better work together, learn from each other, support each other, and and spread it out to more and more and more people. Um, just such great knowledge out there and brilliant work on the ground. So now that's the, so hopefully more adventures together. So a big again, thank you very much, uh, Dunkevel, to our presenters and for putting up with the. The tricky technical problems we've had so apologies again hopefully people haven't missed this um but we do have the video and now hopefully we can support each other in getting it out there and started getting people to use this platform to use the tools for greater system change so um it's late night so thank you very much thank you very much everybody and um yeah we hope ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Yeah, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>